Hello everybody, it's me your doctor friend Siddharth and today we are going to talk on the topic hyponatremia. We all know that our normal serum sodium level of the body is 135 to 145 milliequivalent per liter and the hyponatremia is the condition defined as the serum sodium level below 135 milliequivalent per liter. Today we are talking in particular about hyponatremia because we all know that it is the most common electrolyte abnormality encountered in the clinical practice. First of all, let us classify hyponatremia on the basis of severity. According to the Joint European Guideline, hyponatremia on the basis of severity can be classified as a mild, moderate and severe disease. In mild hyponatremia, the serum sodium layer ranges from 130 to 134, in moderate 125 to 129 and in severe less than 125 milliequivalent per liter. Next is the classification on the basis of onset. If it is of less than 48 hours duration, it is acute hyponatremia and if it is of greater than 48 hours duration, then that is chronic hyponatremia. This acute and chronic onset of hyponatremia is very important to know because it helps us in the management of hyponatremia. The acute hyponatremia can be corrected more rapidly than the chronic hyponatremia and what are the implications of rapid correction of hyponatremia we will discuss further. Let us jump directly into the clinical features of hyponatremia. What are the changes that occurs in our body when the serum sodium level falls? It can be categorized in early manifestations and advanced manifestations. Early manifestations can be as simple as being asymptomatic to headache, nausea and vomiting, lethargy and confusion. The advanced manifestations ranges from decorticate posturing, seizures, various kinds of ophthalmic manifestations like pupillary dilatation, anisocoria in which the pupillary size of two eyeballs are not equal, papil edema, cardiac arrhythmias, brain swelling or cerebral edema that leads to the brainstem herniation and coma and death. Let's talk a bit more detail about cerebral edema. In hyponatremia, the plasma osmolality falls and there will be the hyposmolality. This will lead to the influx of water into the intracellular space because the osmolality inside the cell is higher than the osmolality outside the cell. This will lead to the cerebral edema. But there are the various adaptations of our body to the cerebral edema. First one is by inhibiting the ADS secretion and thirst center. And the second one, the most important, is by the extrusion of the intracellular electrolytes and organic osmolytes like glutamate and aspartate. The brain here tries to extrude the intracellular electrolyte in order to raise the osmolality outside the cell. But since glutamate and aspartate are the excitatory neurotransmitter, this will lead to the seizures. So the status epilepticus is associated with the electrolyte disturbance called hyponatremia. This is one very famous multiple choice question. Let's talk about causes of hyponatremia. What are the conditions that lead to the fall in the serum sodium level of our body? To know the causes of hyponatremia, let first of all categorize hyponatremia into three forms. The first one, according to this schematic diagram, here I am trying to show by the plain blue area, the total body water and by the granular blue area, the total body sodium. In this particular diagram, what has happened is the total body water has decreased, but the total body sodium has decreased out of proportion. And this leads to the condition called hypovolemic hyponatremia. In the second form of hyponatremia, the total body water has increased, but the total body sodium has remained normal. And this leads to the one form of dilutional hyponatremia called euvolemic hyponatremia. And in the third case, the total body water has increased out of proportion to the total body sodium. And this leads to the second form of dilutional hyponatremia or the third form of hyponatremia called hypervolemic hyponatremia. These last two forms of hyponatremia are known as dilutional hyponatremia and they are much more common in clinical practice. Let's try to deal each type of hyponatremia one by one. First one, hypervolemic hyponatremia. In this particular case, as I have already told, the, the total body water will decrease, but the total body sodium will decrease even more. The total body sodium is being lost from the body, out of proportion to the total body water. But what is the source of that loss? To know that, we should first of all know the urinary sodium level. We take the urine sample and try to find out the sodium level in that particular urine sample. And if it is greater than 20, then it is confirmed that the sodium loss, which is ongoing, is from the kidney. And if it is less than 20, then that sodium loss is not from the kidney and that is external loss. What are the causes of renal loss? It can be diuretic excess, also known as iatrogenic hypovolemic hyponatremia, 
adrenaline insufficiency in which the aldosterone is not sufficient enough to absorb sodium, salt losing nephropathies like reflux nephropathy, interstitial nephropathy, post obstructive uropathy, medullary cystic disease, recovery phase of acute tubular necrosis, ETC. Osmotic diuresis is in diabetes mellitus glycosuria, is in starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis, ketonuria, and is in renal tubular acidosis and metabolic alkalosis by current urea. The fourth one is cerebral salt wasting syndrome. It is the condition in which there will be inappropriate nitrate races in response to the cerebral injury, in response to the disease in the, in the brain, like subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, encephalitis, meningitis. It has been proposed that whenever there is cerebral injury, the brain releases natriuretic peptide, which will directly act on kidney to cause nitrate races. And there's the other theory that in case of cerebral injury, the sympathetic nervous system increases the outflow of the sympathetic nervous system increases and this will lead to the increase in the renal perfusion pressure that will lead to the renal uh, loss of sodium. The next one is when the urinary sodium level is less than 20, there will be external loss, the vomiting and diarrhea, tube drainage and insensible loss in case of sweating and burns. Let's talk about now uvolumic hyponatremia. The total body water increases but the total body sodium remains normal. All of these are the conditions that predispose to the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Uh, what happens normally is whenever the plasma osmolality rises, the antidiuretic hormone uh, secretion increases. This will act on the collecting duct of kidney and lead to the free water retention, which will try to counterbalance the increase in the plasma osmolality. But in case of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, FIADH, what happens is regardless of the plasma osmolality, the antidiuretic hormone will inappropriately be secreted in the body, and this will lead to the excess amount of total body water even though the total body sodium is normal. What are the conditions that predispose to SIADS? They are inflammatory or CNS disease, like in case of meningitis, encephalitis, tumors, various CNS tumors, oat cell carcinoma of the lungs, pulmonary disease uh, like severe asthma, pneumonia, drugs like cyclophosphamide and vincristin, and the list goes on and on. The third one is hypervolemic hyponatremia, in which the total body water increases out of proportion to the total body sodium. And these all are the conditions of excess free water retention and they are the very uh, common like congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, liver cirrhosis and acute or chronic renal failure. These again can be uh, categorized by the urinary sodium level. If the urinary sodium level is less than 20, then the causes can be CHF, nephrotic syndrome or liver cirrhosis. If the urinary sodium level is greater than 20, then the cause can be acute or chronic renal failure. Logic is very simple. In case of renal failure, the renal tubule will fail to absorb the sodium level and therefore the sodium level in the urine will increase. Let's talk about the management of hyponatremia. Step one is to confirm that there is hyponatremia. Whenever there is hyponatremia, you need to repeat the serum sodium level to rule out the lab eater and the blood drawing eater. That means you should never draw the blood from the IV line you should never draw the blood from the vein where the fluid is flowing through ETC. After confirming that there is hyponatremia by second time also, then the next step is to calculate the plasma osmolality. Plasma osmolality can be easily calculated by this equation, two times the serum sodium level, dividing the blood nitrogen by 2.8 and dividing the glucose by 18 and adding all these three parameters. By this particular equation, we came to know that apart from knowing serum sodium level, we also need to know the blood urine nitrogen level and the glucose level. But the problem is, most of our laboratory setup will not report us the blood urine nitrogen level, it will report us the urea level. So it is very easy to convert urea into blood urine nitrogen. That means we just take the value of the urea and divide it by 2.14. This will give us the blood urine nitrogen and then we'll proceed further. In this way, we calculate the plasma osmolality. The normal plasma osmolality is 275 to 290 milliosmol per liter. We all know that whenever the serum sodium level falls, and since in this particular equation, the first parameter is two times serum sodium level, so this influences the equation a lot than the other two parameters. Therefore, the loss, the decrease in the serum sodium level will obviously decrease the plasma osmolality. But if the plasma osmolality is still found to be normal, that is 275 to 290 milliosmol per liter, then that is factitious hyponatremia. And it can be found in case of hyperglycemia. It has been well known that in each 100 milligram per DL rise in the serum glucose level, the plasma sodium level or the serum sodium level will fall by 1.6 milliequivalent per liter. 
and this is not of our clinical importance. Next is that the osmolality is found to be greater than 295 milliosmol per liter. That means the plasma is hyperosmolar. This is the case of pseudohyponatremia and it can be found in the cases like hyperlipidemia, paraproteinemia, etc. The third is when the osmolality is found to be less than 275 milliosmol per liter, that means the plasma is hyperosmolar and this is in fact the true hyponatremia and this is of our clinical importance. After confirming that it is the true hyponatremia, the next step, that is the step 3, is to determine the volume status of the patient. Whether the patient is hypo, hyper or euvolemic. This can be accessed clinically or this can be accessed by knowing the central venous pressure. After that, the next step is to treat the patient. The first one is the hypovolemic hyponatremia in which we start 0.9% normal saline. The optimal rate is to increase the serum sodium level by 0.5 to 1 milliequivalent per liter per hour and in a day maximum of 10 milliequivalent per liter needs to be raised. What is the exact rate of infusion? I will discuss in the next slide. The second one is hypervolemic hyponatremia in which we start diuretic and restrict the fluid because this is the condition that leads to the free water retention. The treatment of CHF, treatment of nephrotic syndrome by albumin infusion and steroids is necessary in case of hypervolemic hyponatremia. And the treatment of cause is also necessary in case of euvolemic hyponatremia. Fluid restrictions should also be there and the treatment of SIADH should also be there. The treatment like demiclocycline and lithium are of theoretical importance. If the serum sodium level is less than 120 and if the CNS symptoms are present, then we need to correct that hyponatremia not by the normal saline but by the 3% hypotonic saline. What is the rate of infusion of sodium? This can be calculated online or by various applications or you can use the formula 1000 into rate of rise into total body water plus 1 upon infused sodium minus serum sodium. This will give us the rate of infusion in milliliter per hour. The rate of rise of serum sodium is 0.5 to 1 milliequivalent per liter per hour. For the sake of simplicity, let's keep 1 milliequivalent per liter per hour. The total body water is the weight in kg into 0.6 because it is well known to us that 60% of our total body weight is total body water. And the next one, infusion sodium. If we are using the fluid like 3% saline, then the infusion sodium is 513. If we are using normal saline, infusion sodium is 154. If it is ringless lactate, it is 130. And if it is half normal saline, it is 77. So you put all these parameters in this particular equation. You put the serum sodium level of the patient and try to find out the rate of infusion in ml per hour. I'd also like to take this opportunity to discuss a brief thing in aquatics. We all know what diuretic is, but in diuretics, there will be the loss of water and the loss of salt. But the aquatics is a new concept. There will be the selective loss of water in aquatics. This is by antagonizing the AVP receptor. There are two drugs. The first one to be approved was quinivaptan, it is IV drug. And the next one is tolvaptan, which is an oral drug. Quinivaptan and tolvaptan can be used in euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia in which there will be the free water retention. It will lead to the selective water excretion. Thank you.